point. And I'd actually like to get somebody interested in using these things and, and figuring out how to make this look better. But it's increasing on this interval, it's decreasing on this interval, it's not right. Um, let's look at the, the same question can be asked with a number of different applets. You just look, swap out the applets or you can, this thing is done by a different method. This turns out to be kind of hard to graph to get the thing straight. Um, this last one I like even better because it looks, it's actually copied from David X's uh, Java applet, but this is the HTML5. Okay. So it works on the iPad. Yep, so this works on the iPad. This would work on the iPad. So uh, this is done by David Gage. Um, lot, lots of, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, for once. <laughs> Okay, so this is, uh, and so this one is, is correct. I just take it. Okay, so let's so see what else. So how does this relate to GeoGebra? Does the title you present there? Uh, hang on a second. Okay, sorry. Okay, so actually this is, this is something that I presented at the GeoGebra International Con uh, uh, meeting in our North America meeting last summer in Ithaca. And so it has GeoGebra in it also, but while I was at it, I just showed all of the other applets that are available. So those are graphic input applets. I'll show you. These are some flash applets. And again, this is the minimal type of use of applets, which I, I really like the idea of. Um, this is an applet that just draws a line and gives you a point that you can move around. And we're supposed to find the inflection point, which is something that's about there. Answer. Okay, not bad. This is the exact same applet. Different question. And so on. Like, how far away could the student, uh, how much fine motor skills would they need? <laughs> well, that, that's not an idle question, because there's a lot of accessibility issues. Um, and, and or, or for, like, much younger students who are doing yeah. advanced stuff. Okay, so, so I actually put something in here just for, so you're supposed to get it fairly accurately on this one. But, but of course, you can control this completely, how accurate you have to be. So, I mean... The, the only thing that the applet is doing is it's sending you back the coordinates of this guy and you know where you drew the line and so you know what the coordinates are that you want and now you decide on how accurate you want the point to be. And uh, I was somewhat clever on this one and so if it was close but not real close so that they didn't get the idea that oh no it must be over here somewhere or something like that, I put in a message that said yeah it's not. But well, you have to know a lot of pearl in order to do all that kind of stuff. Like a, just a random professor trying to write a problem like that. Well, that that probably is an issue. Although um, it would be nice to just have you know click a button here to make it up to 0 0.01 away. Mm -hmm. Well, so obviously, uh, so 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 the first thing is the design for this was you wanted problems that would uh, not limit the kinds of stuff that you were teaching, and so for that you need really powerful tools and you need need to do the programming. There is nothing against putting front ends on this thing that will write the programs for you and will then be limited by the creativity of what the design interface was and providing exactly that kind of question. So for example, uh, I don't claim you I don't think you need to know that much Perl. You do have to be not afraid of the programming language of some kind. A little bit of staring at this will suggest that if this if you change this tolerance here, it'll change the behavior a little bit, right? And if you change this tolerance right here, that will change the behavior. No, I meant from scratch, right? They, they didn't have access to that. No, and in fact, you know, but in fact, the right way to do this, or any other programming language for that matter, is to look at models, tweak the models. And so we, uh, to, to really do the thing completely, yes, it takes quite a lot of Perl, but uh, on the other hand, we claim I, I, our hope was, I don't know if it's really true, was that if you just had to modify the problem that was there, you know, okay, it was nice, but you know, this, this needs a little bit more tolerance, it would actually not be a huge barrier no. to, to a mathematician. Yes. Also, now, we weren't, we didn't have high school teachers in mind at the time. You know, and some high school teachers certainly will 
Bruce through it also. But uh, so one yes. thing I want to say is that um, the for these flash applets, the designers of these flash applets, um, um, Doug Ensley and, and Barbara Kesker, like they really wanted to create a uh, like a template applet that you can really sort of drag and place elements and then use that as the applet that you would that embed in a, a web work product. So that they they actually have this goal in mind of designing, like right now actually, you probably don't need to know so much Perl to embed an applet like this into a web work problem, but you need to know a lot of Flash programming, like actions. So here's the GeoGebra front end for the same thing, and you know, so in this one you actually have to figure out, uh, have to grab the point, get the inflection point. And in fact, so one thing that hasn't been done, but was given as an idea, was given to me when I talked to the GeoGebra people, was that they said, um, they were pointing out to me that this is too hard to program these things. So one thing, but they've got lots of high school uh, teachers and, and students, for that matter, programming these really elaborate GeoGebra things. And GeoGebra can output something. And so in that case, rather than making GeoGebra just something that sits inside a problem, make GeoGebra output the entire TG problem. They, it will now output something that you can just copy and paste into an HTML page and, 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 and you'll see the problem. So we can paste it into to web work and we have some automatic hookups and so on so that it'll check the answers. And basically you end up using GeoGebra as a, as a uh, offering tool. Mm -hmm. I don't have a question. Oh, sorry. All right. Yeah. 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 Um, Is another GeoGebra example, and oh, actually, this is uh, um, okay. So uh, there's there's a bunch of error messages and so on that makes it easier. One of the hardest things when you're putting an applet in is getting uh, communication between the applet, and so I actually worked really hard work more, if somebody needs to work more on uh, the API for this kind of thing. And a lot of the work was giving information back and forth about, you know, the applet sent this, we received that, uh, and, uh, so that you can, you're not spending your entire life trying to guess what it is that's gone wrong. You actually have information, debugging information that tells you. So I've turned on some of the debugging switches for this last one. Okay. Um, I think I've gone through. Can I ask a question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the download part copy of the summary set? Yeah. I, I just tried looking at something like that and it looks like I can download not just the uh, not just the questions. Uh-huh. There's the possibilities for that hard copy. Oh. oh, wow. Okay. That's not what I'm seeing. I guess I'm on the... He gets the student version. Oh, I'm you, you, got the, you got the student okay. version, and oh, I can choose... There. Okay. I can get the text source. In principle, you can write exams with this thing. <laughs> I, uh, it takes a little bit of work to... It could be cleaned up so you could actually have an exam printed out this way. Uh, as it is, I get the raw material for the problems. This is what the thing looks like. If you show oh, that's an answer. Show Oh, student. Oh, right. Okay, so they can punch stuff in and then download a hard copy, and they have. And they have what answers that they've entered so far. This is nice. Um, let me um, let me give Jason a chance here. Um, so I can come back after some of these things, but. Uh, Jason, this is Missouri, so I'm going to click the login. So I was just going to demonstrate a couple other things and talk about what, a little bit about what we've done to uh, further Sage integration. Um, a couple of features that um, Mike didn't talk about that you might be interested to know is that you know, if you're hosting uh, web work at your university and you have thousands of students using it uh, on a daily basis, that might attract the attention of your central IT people. Um, so. Uh, you might just know that their um, web work, and I'm going to talk about this later, uh, has a couple web services that make it integrate nicely with Moodle right now. So you can have, instead of the web work front end, you can um, serve web work problems through Moodle. Um, and at the end of the summer, we're going to have a Blackboard building block that will be available. So um, you, can have, you can have it installed into Blackboard, and it'll, um, you can have 
problems linked to in Blackboard, and Blackboard will handle the enrollment management and web work and all that. Um, also, the um, things like security and accessibility. Um, oh, it does have things like LDAP uh, authentication, um, so you can integrate it with your central authentication stuff, um, and it's fairly easy, I guess, to write other other things like that. Um, there are a couple other models, um, and then sort of, you know, we've had sort of recently um, like web application security testing stuff, and um, it's gone fairly well. Um, and uh, and we're and Mike is currently. Uh, by these students working on accessibility issues, so um, it's not fully Bible compliant right now, but it, the idea is that it will be by the end of the summer, and uh, so those kind of big central IT kind of concerns, um, you can you can have good answers to those questions. Um, so I guess the other so the first thing was I was going to just. A lot of the point of embedding this stuff into Moodle and Blackboard and so on is that people are saying, well, do you have leakies involved with your stuff or do you have chat rooms and so on? And we don't want to implement those in WebWork. In fact, we we implemented more of a course management system than we intended because there weren't course management systems when we started out. But if you want something more full-featured, you just embed this in uh, to, uh, uh, you just, you're missing a J. In oh. thing. Uh, you just embed it in something like Moodle, and uh, we can show you either privately or later. And uh, the, the, that handles all of the organization of the course, and when it's time to do the homework, you're shipped out to WebWork to do your homework, and the grades from WebWork are shipped back to Moodle or Blackboard. And so then, then we use their gradebook to do everything. Um, so I guess the first thing I was going to show you is the library browser with the, uh, right now we have, uh, in our, these are, the the, live, the actual National Problem Library is out in some subversion repository, and when you install WebWork, you install it locally, and you can update it as problems are added. So we currently have um, 22,693 problems in it, and then um, you can sort of browse through them with this. Anything you're interested in seeing? Algebra, calculus? Isn't that number theory? There's no number theory. Oh, no, 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 no. There's an opening for a number theory professor. With a number <laughs> theory is like all the theory of math. Yeah, it's involved, right. Discrete math. Wow, the number Finite math. That's where we would need say, to see a problem evaluator. Yeah, that that would be actually, helpful, actually. That a lot of systems have. are weak. Yeah, like it's like probably hard to get a number of primes up to 10 to the 9 in Perl. Probably. <laughs> you know, when we first started this, we figured we'd eventually go to some CAS behind it, uh -huh. and what we found with the things that we implemented was that we just hadn't needed it yet. Almost everything we wanted to find you know, was on CTAM, and so we pulled things off CTAM and used those. Uh -huh. uh, but uh, the hooks are there to look at the Yeah, like, there's some hard things, like integer factorization comes up all over the place in number theory for a lot of right. algorithms. And it's if, hard. If not we had a number of theorists doing this, yeah. we would have we would have been going to CAS a lot earlier. Yeah. <laughs> so it seems like it would be pretty easy to look into a Sage web service or even just a expect to a Sage server to make a Perl problem generator that just ships your stuff off to Sage. Yeah. That's actually. Or so he is a number theorist, but he wasn't. Or a single source. Or a single source web service. Right? Yeah, a web service. So we can do calculus. Yeah. Yeah, that's funny. Or use a web number theorist. Okay, it starts. <laughs> and then you can uh, view problems and uh, <laughs> view them in math. Yeah. It's really sick of number theory. This is this is how you go about picking problems. So this well, is actually okay. useful to see. So some of the problems produced an error. I'm not sure why, but let's get those. Um, then you can kind of scroll through and see what kind of problems. So you would select these. You would add them to the target set. You could try it as the instructor over here. You could edit the problem here if you wanted to change the source code. Does it uh, change it for everyone, or is there? Is um, Yes. Yeah, oh, it does no, not change not. it in the repository. So if you were to edit this problem, you would uh, be taken to the problem editor. And then, um, so the warning up here says, 
you can't you can't edit this. You have to save a local copy, and so you have the option to do that down here, save as. So can you some sort sort of report to the repository that maybe you found something? Oh, report yeah. about. Report about. Yeah, <laughs> right. That's right. Although uh, that that's not as easy as it should be, and not oh. as uh, I mean that that could be improved a lot. We really want to make that. So easy that everybody does it, and we have clearly not succeeded so well, far. Sometimes the program clearly wrong. I mean, it's program, right? So, so oh, oh yeah. Sometimes it's clearly wrong, and, so, and then there are other times when it's not wrong, but you know the formatting isn't too right. nice, and so on, and you can fix it up. So I mean, there's a lot of use here for. It. I mean, the way it kind of works now is that somebody would report a bug, and somebody would have written that problem, and ideally that person, if like would be a recent either John Jones would be in charge of fixing it or the the person the person who wrote that collection of problems uh, would be responsible for fixing it. Um, that person so long. Yeah. What is the view using the C number? Oh, so uh, the problems are randomly. So you get a random seed, and that determines like the limits of integration here. So all the sort of parameters that are uh, randomly generated. And so when you go back here, you look down at the source code. The problem. Uh, you can see like this parameter. There are two parameters here, A and C, that are uh, that are random. This so A is a random number between two and four was step size one. C is between two and eight, <coughs> and then uh, so that would just give you different versions of the problem. So if you would, ideally, as the instructor, you want to try it a couple times. So if you have the template, which is at this address right here, and you have the seed, you have a complete reconstruction of the problem. And uh, these things here, like you see formula and real, um, these are creating math objects, and that's math objects is something that David wrote. Or I meant to say the author of JS Math wrote. Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what's nice about it is it so it has it like it's center of, stage. Right. <laughs> So it stores like its tech representation and uh, like its pro function representation. It has all these useful features and, and methods that you could use to um, make problem authoring sort of easier and, and, uh, and better quality, I guess. Um, Can we replace a button like translate, propose a translation button? Propose a translation, yeah. The, oh, this is another thing I, I didn't mention. The, um, there's uh, a a project that's well on its way to um, internationalize the application. So, um, some this person Ben Walter, I guess, it, uh, he's at the Middle East Technical University in Cyprus. He just showed up on the doorstep and hey, I've I've done this, right? And I've got some questions, and um, so it's basically done. And uh, you know, it's got to well, be picked up a little started. bit. <laughs> yeah, basically started, right? Uh, but so he did got Turkish right? and English, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's only for the application. Yeah. For the problems, my guess is that, um, well, there are people like WebAll in, uh, in Finland and so on who are interested in trying to write problems in such a way that it automatically translates. My guess is that it's probably easier for the most part. That, like, if you go down, where is the text stuff uh, on this like, problem? So, well, that stuff doesn't need to be translated necessarily. And then there's just this part right here. You just translate this problem and make an alternate version. And then, uh, and then we can put some kind of switch in so that, for example, you can have problems with in bunch of different languages than if you're you know, doing it in French when you get, a, get the French versions of the problems. But I think they're going to have to be translated problem by problem. Yeah, of course. Trying so, to do them automatically. And I mean, there's a lot that's kind of converging because we've got Ben on the one hand uh, working on the whole application, but then also, for example, we've got there's a few people in uh, Mexico City that are submitting today a collection of problems in written in Spanish, right? So, and that's what it takes, I guess, to develop a problem library. Well, I guess we'll have to change the name from National Problem Library to right. something right. else. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, but I mean, you could probably well, support, like, get text, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay, so just a couple embedding things. So if you want to use, um, there are easy things to embed, like an experiment where you can embed um, 
like little slideshows or videos for hints or solutions. Um, show this example. So this is nice. I tend to have at the beginning of the semester uh, the first homework assignment. This is loading from Google. So you can them. Google um, the I tend to have my a first assignment just about the syllabus and. Um, I tend to present it on something where they read through it and then they answer questions about it, and and that's nice because, you know, then it, it, you know it's a like very large class maybe, and, and then later I always get students. Oh, I didn't know my didn't, my instructor didn't tell me this. Well, you know, you, you knew. Um, and then there's you can also there are homework assignments about. I don't know why that's not loaded. Well, that was working a minute ago on my book. Well, the idea is that you can embed things like this. Can I get, like, a copy of this problem from somewhere? Is it in a repository? That's a perfect... Yeah, actually, you know what? I'm, I haven't done this yet, but I am... Uh, Mike's been encouraging me to do this, and I'm going to do it soon. If you go on our wiki, and I will, uh, of course, give you a copy here, but... Um, so the wiki's local are coming up in for the web work hole and then the wiki is. Okay. Are you looking for the wiki? This, this, uh, okay. um, there's a very nice collection uh, in the authoring documentation the documentation for authors. Um, uh, so problem authoring background, which largely, and then about math objects, um, that would be a nice place. And then there is um, the index of problem techniques. And so there's always, a, you know, the forums, we have pretty active forums and people always come on and ask problems like, can you do this when you're writing a, a problem? And the answer is, is probably yes. There are a ton of, of things. So if you wanted to um, know how to do uh, graphic graphing in 3D with cylindrical coordinates, right? And you would pull up that wiki page, and it would explain, it would give you an example and explain how to do it. So why don't you show them what the three sections? So these are the okay. sections of, of, of why did writing work for a problem, and demystify a little bit. So. Um, there's one section that's not shown here, which is uh, like tagging and comments and stuff. So that we have in the problem in the library browser. How do you know what what subject, what section, what um, what what uh, what subsection, that sort of thing, what textbook? Um, that's all tagged at the top, and that's not shown here. But um, so the problem starts always with this um, with this document, and then load macros uh, basically decides what capabilities you're going to have when you're authoring the problem. So this math objects is loading in math objects, um, parser vector utils for um, doing things with vectors, the live graphics, cylindrical plot 3D is interface to live graphics. Um, and then here, um, it's kind of the initialization part where uh, you declare the variables. Um, notice that in this problem, the context numeric always has a variable x, but then um, whoever wrote this problem, probably Paul, is declaring a bunch of other variables to be real numbers, um, and then um, some random parameter, and then initializing this plot, this 3D. Uh, the important part about the context is the student puts an A in their formula, they will get not an error message that says A is not understood in this context. So you would get some warning of which variables are actually being used. And you can also specify bounds for the variables, things like that. Um, once you do that, then you pass all that information to the part that's going to display the text to the students. And the context text strings makes everything, all of these things appear in the text strings so that um, they can display uh, nicely on the page with images or MathJax or JSMath. Um, and then this puts the plot in there. Actually, I think this problem is only putting the plot in there. And then uh, at the bottom is, uh, there's no answer. Th this is where you normally put answers, but there was no question, so there's right. no answer. There's no question. This is just how to put in the plot, right? So you normally you'd have an answer checking section. 
there is another section that has entire problems, uh, problems by subject, but this is just kind of like the technique fragments that you need to do a certain part. Um, so the other thing I was going to talk about is um, just kind of give you an idea what we were working on yesterday. <coughs> we'll work on more today. We, one thing we're really excited about is we're going to try to turn Sage into the ultimate web work problem authoring environment. Well, and ultimate. <laughs> ultimate. <laughs> Super ultimate deluxe, actually, if you want to get technical. Um, so let's see, it was glass. And also, you can always do something yeah. else, right? <laughs> <laughs> Free point off. Yes, one day this was the current yeah. state of the art stage server, but now it's the oldest. <laughs> so, um, one thing that's really nice and getting used a lot is the web service, the web services in WebWork. And so that's what enables the, uh, the, the Moodle plugin and this Blackboard plugin. Is there, there, are, there are three or really two usable, I guess, web services. There's an R XML RPC web service and there's a, uh, there's a SOAP web service. And so this just demonstrates using the uh, XML RPC web service from inside the Sage. A little bit uh, there. Actually, it's even simpler yeah. than that. This is just that you can call into deep into a problem set because of the right from the command line, from the URL itself. Right. So this first example actually was uh, I, I was talking to Bruce about he was uh, embedding the GeoGebra applets with an iframe, right? A little bit there, and moved over just a little bit, so it fits on your screen. It's cutting off on the left. Drag it to the right. Okay. The hole, yeah. There we go. Great. Okay. So let's see. Can you see the? So this is using the iframe idea just to embed the embed the application inside a notebook, and that's nice as far as it goes. But you don't actually can actually interact with it. You're just sort of presented with it. So this is kind of just going through what it would take to um, access web work through the web service. And we're, we're hoping to try to refine that and make it easier to do. And then um, the idea would be you'd have sort of a, a big text entry box where you'd write a problem, and then you would evaluate, and over here it would, it would render the problem. And um, so all problem authors, web work problem authors, could do things like, you know, they would have the computer, computer algebra capabilities of Sage, and that would make it easier uh, they think the right problems. Right, so. Could you say, for example, draw a plot in Sage and embed it as in? You, yes. yes, you could. Oh, well, well, well as it would be automatic, but that would be a couple of images that you generate. Right. right. So, so we, yeah. part of what's cool about this, too, is that it's sort of suggesting ways that the web, the web work web service could be improved. So, right. you know, in this, the I, when we were sort of talking about this, a cool idea that Mike had would be that. You, know, you could sort of author the problem. You know, you would have you would authenticate into a course. You would have a list of sets. You would author a problem, and then from within Sage, put the problem to the course and in that set, right? And that's not currently implemented in the web service, but it could be. And and you could also have it transfer whatever pictures and so on that, that are used by the problem. So. Okay, so uh, the first step is uh, just read a random problem into Sage, so you can you recognize the. Uh, the source code of the problem. And uh, this is a problem involving uh, matrices written at Dartmouth. Okay. Um, and so the next couple sections just kind of initialize a lot of the course environment stuff. So um, in this particular version of the web service, you have to pass a lot of course environment information to it. And so um, display mode is, you saw inside the application, there were images and MathJax and JS Math and stuff. Um, and then specify some URLs. And so this, the RPC, the, this web service, it doesn't right now authenticate you into a course and it's just kind of a dummy user in a dummy course. Um, but if once the authentication gets working, then all this stuff you wouldn't really have to send to it because that would be in the course environment. Right? Um, and then these are kind of standard, um, standard uh, uh, PG modules for um, building different things and problems. All right. And then finally, gather all that stuff together in one big data structure, structure this input table. So this is where um, the Python stuff comes in. 
Um, so part of the Python standard library library is this XML RPC lib, and um, so just initialize that, point it to the web service, and um, and then the small input table is you can ignore that. The actual work is done here with this response equals server dot web work XML RPC render problem input table, and um, so also there's. This could also be done with SOAP, but there's no standard SOAP library in, in Python, so um, you would have to load one in. And uh, you evaluate this, and then it goes out and gets, um, goes up to web work, and gets what it needs. And I probably should have done this because the, uh, obviously I'm up here talking. It's not really there. Oh, there we go. Let yeah. me reevaluate all this. Did you have to evaluate everything? Oh, maybe the wireless is. Yeah, it says searching for same server. Oh, okay. All right, well, once you get that working, voila, you have a web work problem embedded in Sage. And uh, so it comes back, it returns it, submit answers, and so you can submit all that directly from Sage. And uh, I think it's pretty cool. There are a lot of things that we're excited about trying to do with it. Um, also, uh, it also brings up the point of in the notebook, you know, if you had some kind of web service that, that we could talk to from web work, um, that might make it easier to integrate it, integrate it into web work problems. That, that's actually would be the ideal way to use Sage as a computer uh, as a back end for it. So web work would simply We've add something to our web service says that I've got this problem that's too hard for me to handle, factor this number for me, and send it out to Sage, and Sage would send it back. Mm -hmm. Web work would pretend that they could do it. It's the idea behind the single cell server is it's a, it's a party, whatever, some sort of web service, but it also has a front end. So. Right. Cool. Okay. Questions? Okay. All right, I guess we're all set. Thanks a lot. Yes. yes. Go ahead. I was just going to point out a Python issue. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh. Yes, somebody. Go ahead. Uh, well, if, if anyone would like, hopefully you've had a chance to play with these MAA 101, 102 courses and so on. If anyone wants their own course, just come see me. It takes me about five minutes to set it up, and I'll give it to you. So I'm going to use it this fall. Oh, you know, I want classes. Okay. Well, I can give it to you now, and you can play with it. As I said, Hosted 2 is used to host all of these 150 courses. Oh, actually, show them, show them the map. Show them the real map. Oh, yeah. On the website. Is there a question? Okay, you had a, you had a uh, Python issue. Oh, um, when you catch exceptions, there's two ways to catch exceptions, but there's sort of four compatible way to do it. Uh -huh in your code is to do accept the do the exception as e instead of the exception right. comma e. Well, let's see. So in Python 3, it'll be the only way to catch exceptions. Go in 2.6. Yeah, you, you do a truck right there. Accept XML yeah. RPC dot fault comma error. Uh -huh. And replace that comma with the keyword as. As, okay. And with the space around it. Yeah, there you go. And it's forward compatible with Python 3. Okay. Yeah, it's a, we think there's a change on the print. Yeah. Oh, well, but no, yeah, sure. Okay. Well, so so not 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 we'll continue to work on this no, no, this no, afternoon no, if you guys can tell us how to do it right. Oh, it's 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 oh, like okay. uh, yeah, I copied this straight from the 2.7 documentation. Ah, so. oh, okay. <laughs> show show, it's show the, the wiki and the map. Right. right. Uh, so here's the actual map of uh, users. If it's, let's see where it's going. Uh, it's like, it's still less there. WW wiki and the less There we go. Because you don't have the comfortable parentheses. Yeah. So oh. there's the actual map. And then we've got some uh, international users. You see we've got people in Mexico there. Um, these guys in Europe and beyond. Where's where the Turkish translation of Turkish? Yeah. Uh, yes. And uh, Russian. Yeah. 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 Uh, Dubai, right? Yeah, Dubai. Uh, no. Uh, 
device down there. Yeah, the oh, device is a UA. It's cut right It's cut right Yeah, that's right. It's cut Yeah, there you are. Okay. So who's in Iowa? In Iowa, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's in Iowa. No, no one's in Iowa. No, they're Cornell, Colorado, and Central. Okay. Yeah, Cornell, the North, Cornell uses it. So the guy at Cornell has been trying to use it for computer science. And, and Cornell, Iowa. Yeah, Cornell, Iowa. The real Cornell. The real Cornell. They had a name before the other Cornell. <laughs> I didn't realize that. <laughs> I'm sure that's every time they talk to me. Yeah. We've got here, we've got uh, they are the good Cornell. You may have to expand it a little bit. Okay, so. Cornell College. Uh, no, there's actually two there. You Central College. Have, Central College. If you expand it a little bit, it will be able to read the other uh, server. Jason, Jason can certainly do this on his own machine, I think. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any, any, any other questions? Yeah, or? Right. Anything else? Okay, uh, there's the textbook meeting at 2, so there's certainly time for lunch, but if you want to attend that, you should have enough time, but that'll get a little bit close. I think we'll maybe go next door, there's a projector in there and plenty of seating for that, and uh, otherwise, start coding. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have some people showing up this afternoon, folks here, we'll do uh, introductions and all. Okay, right.